Our speaker tonight is Mr. Robert L. Probst. He has a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of Denver in 1943 with a major in fine arts and a minor in mathematics. He has a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Colorado in 1950, and his major was painting and sculpture. After leaving the Navy in 1946, he taught in the fine arts field at Tarleton State College in Texas for two years, and then for five years at the University of Colorado. In 1953, he left the university to start the Probst Company in Denver, Colorado, engaging in architectural sculpture and speculative product development. In the next seven years, the company developed a pattern of retainer and royalty relationships with a variety of major companies, one of which was the Herman Miller Company working on non-assigned product invention and development. By 1960, the problems of doing creative equity work for several companies at the same time became unreasonably complex, and the decision was made to merge the Proops Company with Herman Miller Incorporated, forming a new research division Mr. Probst is head of this research division. The responsibility of this new division is to help Herman Miller grow from the furniture business to an ability to supply broad environmental solutions and to exploit product ideas that improve and simplify people's lives. Through both Herman Miller's internal capacity and through cooperative relationships with outside companies. So we're very happy to have with us tonight Mr. Bob Probst. confused by that, uh, the introduction, which sounds like I've been mixed up in many things and, uh, and ending up in a rather peculiar profession, a director of a research division, when it sounds like I started out as an artist of some kind. But in a way, it seems to us uh, quite appropriate that uh, the process of the artist now may have something to do with problem-solving attitudes in our kind of society where we certainly are gifted with a very great particular kind of capabilities in all our technical areas. And uh, it seems that we certainly do need some effort now in relating all our many gifted capabilities and some solutions for our environmental position. Uh, the reason I don't have any slides tonight, uh, I thought it would be quite interesting to discuss perhaps some kinds of impact that I think we're going to be feeling uh, very seriously now and that will have a great deal to do with, with architects and designers, people who are trying to solve the problems for living spaces. Uh, we hear the term behavioral sciences frequently nowadays. I, I don't know what we think this means, but and uh, I don't think we are too seriously aware that this may have serious implication in our lives, but uh, my impression after six years now of quite intense work in the area of trying to relate many kinds of skills and disciplines to the problems of solving environmental solutions is that we're on the verge of tremendous implementation now of of knowledge from the behavioral science areas. I think uh, I'd like to discuss with you a little bit tonight how this will change our concepts of design, 
and how soon. Uh, in order to keep this subject somewhat within reason, it's a tremendously complex and involved subject, is uh, in our research division we've tried to focus on ideas that would have something to do with the health and productivity of people in living spaces. It seemed to us if we could concentrate on this idea that we would be able to rather continuously govern the impact and the importance of, of a tremendous uh, volume of output now in science areas. Uh, we believe it will have a very profound effect in the near future and even now. I'd like to discuss with you tonight some things I think are already happening that uh, should be very thought-provoking. And we think that uh, this kind of capability is already a major force in the, in the sense in the design world, or in the, at least in the world where people are trying to decide what constitutes appropriate living solutions. Uh, one interesting thing I think is to consider it's not so much that the behavioral scientists have decided now to bear on how we live and how we design for it, it seems to us pretty much that life itself or the nature of our society has forced this new responsibility on us. All of a sudden, this kind of person has the kind of answers that we really need. It really is, it represents a leap forward in knowledge and is really caused seriously by the change in the rate of change. I'm sure everybody is belabored by this idea that we're suffering or we're impacted by serious rate of change, but it's really the change in the rate of change now that is causing really fundamental changes for us. I think the ideas that we're going to be confronted with now for some time may not be attractive to everybody. Uh, for one thing, it will confront us with uh, things that are going to be quite different, I think, in the way of the surroundings. And we like and we understand what we already have. Uh, we probably view it as the nature of our present culture. It has some re resolution. It's popular. It's in some instances neatly understood and professionally unencumbered. In fact, there's some point for at least some professionals in not allowing all kinds of secondary involvement to over-influence their area of art. And uh, frequently I think we have uh, expressions that it are sort of a statement in themselves. And the question is, shouldn't we work hard to preserve this kind of value in our surroundings? I'd like to quote from, uh, briefly from uh, the October issue of the Journal of Social Issues, which is a kind of area that we look frequently into. We spend much of our time with psychologists and uh, anthropologists and people who are thinking seriously now about problems in, of this nature. This is a quote from uh, Jerome D. Frank, who's the president of this society. He says, our generation is living through the culmination of a struggle between man and nature that began when someone first resolved to sail into the wind rather than letting currents and breezes carry him where they would. After he learned how to do it, he became able to choose his destination, so he had to develop navigational instruments to tell him where he was and how to reach his goal. From then on, step by step, man has gradually bent the forces of nature to his will until today, Barring only his ability to conquer death, he seems to be nature's master. But let us not become too self-confident. At first, the benefits of our soul on the natural environment far exceeded the cost, but now the latter are rapidly mounting. Nature may simply have been biding its time. In the past, men could shrug their shoulders in the face of most of the evils of life because they were powerless to prevent them. A misfortune like a fish kill could be blamed on God or fate. I, yeah, you're thinking about this tanker breaking up off of the coast of England, a uh, single incident, man-made incident like this now having tremendous effect on the whole southern end of a country. This is the sort of thing we should think about now. He says, nothing is any longer inevitable. Since everything can be accomplished, everything must be deliberately chosen. 
it is in human power for the first time to achieve a level of welfare exceeding our wildest imaginings or to commit race suicide slowly or rapidly. The choice rests only with us. Perhaps we are really realizing that no degree of control over nature can solve basic problems of social living. Our dazzling material triumphs are rather a warning that in the end, all depends on improving the quality of our relationships with each other. Without this, all our scientific and technical triumphs may only hasten our destruction. Man today is making his own stormy weather. Perhaps it is not too much to hope that the same qualities which enable him to triumph over the destructive forces of nature will enable him to master those he has himself created. So this phrase now, everything must be deliberately chosen, is something that I think is going to be very uh, significant now in the way we approach our problem solving. We must choose and in concert. Uh, we can't afford to be isolated in our effect. Uh, the kind of disciplines we're involved in now must be coherent with each other. And the environmental effect that we're going to try to achieve also must be very coherent. Another uh, writer, another psychologist writing on stimulus and symbol, Robert Case has some other <coughs> comments now. In contrast to the environmental science disciplines, the design dis disciplines abound in symbol. They are ver veritable symbol makers. The challenge to the designer is to create a design that fill, fulfills some function and also proclaims symbolically some deeper meaning in building, garden, concrete, or spatial arranging, arrangement. The tension between the need to enclose, house, or cite specific human activities and to create, create symbolic means in their own right has not been an equitable one. Much, while much design seems mediocre and fails in both its form and function, the attention of the most talented has been directed to the aesthetic expression of the total design, not to the behavioral consequences of their work. I think uh, one of the things now that uh, our particular interest is, is now is what are the untended consequences of this kind of work? And I believe this kind of design now is certainly being strongly illuminated in question. We're beginning to understand how we function in living spaces as both as individuals and organizations and the questions are certainly interesting. I'd like to start first by discussing briefly uh, not behavior of man by himself, but behavior of man in institutions. And the reason I think this is perhaps a good starting point is it's one of the first places now where we're beginning to get rather interesting insight as to how man really interacts <clears throat> and how he's able to survive or not survive in major organizations which is something we really all are a part of nowadays. And uh, I think one of the first things to consider is that we are now essentially a culture that has migrated from manual to mind-oriented tasks. Most of us dwell in some kind of office spaces of some kind or interior spaces. We work inside. And moreover, there's also a migration from rote tasks to judgment and creative responsibilities. Uh, I think it was last year, uh, one of the business magazines ran an analysis of the decline in the secretarial clerk activities in major organizations. Now, this isn't a minor factor. It was something like a 60% decline in the last 10 years of this kind of task. So man's refuge in both manual tasks or simple tasks that require no real thinking are rapidly disappearing. And uh, the fact that we're all combined on these mind-oriented tasks in the multi-numbers organizations really are beginning to put serious uh, pressures on the way we behave. I think uh, one of the most significant things that is beginning to happen to major organizations is that there is a transition from operational philosophy from reductive to developmental practices. This may sound a little academic to you, but I'd like to go into this a little more. What does this mean? It 
means that almost from time immemorial, we've had a sort of reductive approach in, in organizations. We say that an organization is a process of ordering and forbidding is a means to assure performance. It says that people in general avoid responsibility, therefore they must be directed. In essence, uh, bosses know the most and knowledge descends down to the lower levels. Independence is limited and mistakes call for penalties. Now the developmental approach uh, says something very different. It says it's natural for people to seek responsibility and that they enjoy it. That the performer on any level needs challenge and encouragement to gain top performance and he can participate in his own, own goal setting and will behave like a manager on any level. Now this may seem to have relatively little to do with design, but in actual practice, it calls for really a major revision in the form of our spaces now. Consider some of the implications of buildings and offices as they're now visualized. They're essentially reductive in expression. We see ascending levels of bosses, each with status reinforcement in size, and closure, and accessories and knowledge and judgment are passed down and conventional design expresses this very explicitly. Uh, I think you could probably see it here at Ball State University or any organization that you walk into. But most interestingly now, uh, many major organizations, especially those now who are thinking hard on this subject, are actually using social psychologists and other behavioralists in trying to decide what causes people to be successful, uh, productive, and and happy in organizations uh, quarrel with this seriously. A <coughs> uh, very particular and very interesting example is the company, uh, the Texas Instrument Company in Dallas, Texas, which you might recognize as one of the space age companies, a uh, rapidly growing company uh, that uses scientists of, in great numbers and great uh, technical staff. But this is not a small company now, it's a 36 thousand person company and uh, it behaves very differently now than the usual reductive organization. They feel that uh, the interest should be focused on achievement itself rather than the trappings of success and they have eliminated the conventional office symbols of success. They feel that flaunting status and authority seriously inhibits communication between levels and diverts attention from actual goals. They have no carpets, no executive dining rooms, no stratified furniture or furnishings, and no named parking lots. The facilities and space are provided on the basis of performance needs. And this, uh, I think, is bound to have a very unusual effect in the nature of the spaces we provide for people. First of all, it assumes that uh, brilliance, decision-making, uh, unusual capability may exist on all levels in an organization. No longer do we exist in organizations where the smartest man is at the top necessarily, but knowledge of all levels is important. Therefore, we may find that people well down the authority ladder may actually require more sophisticated surroundings and more elaborate services, and their whole environment uh, certainly will be quite different. Now this doesn't mean that handsome appearance is no longer a concern. I think every uh, possible attempt to still keep handsome appearance as part of the man environment is certainly still important. It does say, however, that there are some things about present appearance that are no longer appropriate. I think it's also interesting in this case, uh, we see the rise of a behavioral science to the top echelon in the management of a major corporation who has something to do with the major decision making in this kind of organization. The second thing I'd like to suggest is a major influence now and beginning to be on our, the nature of our surroundings is the continuous process of change, growth, and evolution of organizations. Now this has always been true However, until lately, we've been able to behave as if we were part of static organizational structures. Uh, we could visualize a specific activity, design a specific building, and we could uh, determine a number of stratified spaces and conceive that a specific number of people in a fixed relationship 
would be placed in this facility. And presumably, if you did a superb job of planning, this would all uh, be very smooth and everything would work just fine. However, I'd like to read you a brief uh, comment from Northcott Parkinson, the person of Parkinson's law of fame, who's a British economist, who uh, published an article called How to Tell When You're Obsolete. I quote, <coughs> Every student of human institutions is familiar with the standard test for addressing the importance of any given individual, or for assessing the importance of any given individual. The number of doors to be passed, the number of his personal assistants, the number of telephones on his desk, these three figures combined with the depth of his carpet in centimeters have given us a simple formula which is reliable for most parts of the world. It is less widely known that the same sort of measurement is applicable, but in reverse to the institution itself. Take, for example, a publishing organization. The most successful publishers have a strong tendency, as we know, to live in a state of chaotic squalor. The visitor who applies at the obvious interest is led outside and around the block, down an alley, and up three flights of stairs. A young and vigorous research establishment is similarly housed as a rule on the ground floor of what was once a private house from which a crazy wooden corridor leads to a corrugated iron hut in what was once a garden. The institutions already mentioned, lively and productive as they may be, flourish in such shabby and makeshift surroundings that we might turn with relief to an institution clothed from the outset with convenience and dignity. The outer door is bronze and glass, is placed centrally in a symmetrical facade. Polished shoes glide quietly over the shining rubber to the glittering, silent elevator. The overpoweringly cultured receptionist will murmur with carmen lips into an ice blue receiver. She will wave you into a chromium armchair, consoling you with a dazzling smile for any slight but inevitable delay. Looking up from a glossy magazine, you will observe how the wide corridors radiate toward departments A, B, and C. From behind closed doors will come the subdued noise of an ordered activity. A minute later, you are ankle deep in the director's carpet, plodding sturdily toward his distant, tidy desk. <clears throat> Hypnotized by the chief's unwavering stare, cowed by his matisse, you feel you have found real efficiency at last. In point of fact, you will have discovered nothing of the kind. It is now known that perfection of plan layout is achieved only by institutions on the point of collapse. Experience proves that such an institution will die. It is choked by its own perfection. It cannot take root for lack of soil. It cannot grow naturally for it has already grown. Fruitless by its very nature, it cannot even flower." End of quote. Well, you have to take uh, Parkinson with a grain of salt, but nevertheless, there is some very interesting clues and what he's discussing here. And I think the most important thing now is to think is that we have left behind forever the age when you could be a sort of a lifetime businessman, one kind of an organization, one kind of engineer, practicing one kind of engineering for a whole professional life, one kind of teacher, name it. Nostalgia for this form lingers on, but this increasing rate of change in the growth of organizations, the nature of tasks and technology, and the values of society itself will no longer accept the premise of static facil facilities. It's a far too mobile, changing situation. In fact, uh, most organizations now who think seriously about their fate and their purpose consider uh, that they either grow or die. And most, in fact, uh, you can almost set a level. If they feel like they're not growing at a rate of at least 10% a year, most corporations or major organizations feel that they're in a declining condition. And this is a, a very appropriate uh, conclusion if you, if you match your performance with the rest of the world's dynamics and change. I'd like to tell you briefly about another organization who's behaving quite in quite an unusual manner. The Hewlett Packard Corporation in Palo Alto, California, which again is a space age company and tends to be the kind of corporation or organization who has some ability to see its own destiny and determine a new way of life. It's not encumbered by old patterns. Their conclusion uh, is that the sensitive regrouping of people to meet a day-by-day -day objectives and task requirements is the key to productivity. 
They feel that even a 50-foot separation of individuals who should be communicating fluently with each other can cause decisive task failure. <coughs> this grouping objective, coupled with a growth rate of about 25% per year for over 15 years, has caused them to adopt a totally new attitude about facilities and buildings. And this is really the natural state of the organizations today. Now, the kind of thing they're likely to do is move an entire uh, thousand-man department into a totally new space over a weekend. And they're liable to set up any place, a combination office, laboratory, uh, any kind of unusual combination of facilities that they feel meets the unique demands of a task group in operation. They don't hesitate for a minute to uh, reform, redesign the combinations of people uh, for their best purposes. Uh, the next thing I think that uh, we have to begin to consider uh, is a ponderous influence now on our <clears throat> behavior is the state of information handling and communication services. And I know you're again, you're all belabored by the great ideas of the great information explosion. But again, it's, it's interesting to consider that in less than most of our lifetimes, and certainly mine, we have moved from a posture of being underinformed to a perpetual condition of oversupply. And this is very hard for man to change his attitude that uh, it is not good necessarily to just bring me more information because we've come through a total man's history up till now where his entire welfare, ability to do things, his major limitation was that he did not have enough and appropriate information. So he's always called for more. Now, if you happen to be a scientist in the Atomic Energy Commission, uh, reading the index of their publication file could consume an eight-hour day. Now, this means you wouldn't even, wouldn't even get close to relevant information in your skill area. It would mean you could spend an entire day just searching an index of possible information that they could use. Uh, in five years, it's projected that there will be half a million pages will be published every day. And there's a serious question is whether published or printed information is, will survive in its present uh, form as a means of uh, communication. <coughs> Vannemar Bush uh, says that science is bogged now in its own product, knowledge. 95% uh, of the information we store is never referred to again. Uh, another interesting comment that I've heard frequently is if information is printed, it's at least a year obsolete, at least in the many areas of endeavor. So if you wait till you see it published in a technical journal, you can assume that you're well behind the state of the art. This is no longer uh, the most relevant information. So the tremendous struggle now is underway to how to achieve a current awareness, how to act on real-time information, how to behave with information. And I, perhaps you're wondering why this would have any effect whatsoever on your surroundings. Well, it does because man is, has to be recognized as, as a seriously limited information consumer. He has some natural capacities, but uh, now we even have to make some very astute choices of how we surround himself with communication services. And in a sense, everything we put around him tells him something or deprives him some, of something. And in fact, the single most important thing, uh, purpose of surrounding uh, probably now is to provide the most eloquent kind of communication service. Now, when I'm talking about that, I'm, I'm referring to everything from putting people together or protecting yourself from overexposure of too many people, or may assuring yourself that you have appropriate exposure to exactly the right people, it starts on a people basis, it starts on the ability to have some kind of self-built-in perception of what is appropriate information and how you can structure your environment to provide this for you. I'd like to tell you about an interesting example in Michigan where we have a major drug company involved in wonder drug production. It's, in fact, it's the heart of their existence. Uh, periodically, their scientists have another, hope to have another breakthrough in drugs. Uh, 
few years ago, they determined that their old laboratory was very inappropriate. This was an old building and had a typical lab situation and people worked in the little, their little labs on the perimeter, but uh, the managers noticed that scientists kept popping out of their lab spaces because they could see each other and spent an uh, undue amount of time just talking and gabbing with each other. Uh, they designed a new building, uh, this time using one of the best architectural firms in the country and one that pays very serious attention to its chores and does not try to avoid problems. And they spent uh, elaborate time trying to determine what would be the best design for their scientists, critical scientists, in a very important laboratory. Uh, one of the conclusion they reached was, well, uh, if they spend too much time talking to each other, and we want them to spend more time on the bench creating wonder drugs, then uh, let's turn this inside out. Let's face the laboratories out. We'll put glass walls on the building. We'll have outside corridors. We'll have an inside service corridor. The scientists can go into his lab in the morning and look out across some beautiful landscape and not be disturbed by this unseemly hubbub. But now, uh, four or five years later, a very disturbing thing is happening. Uh, they are noticing, first of all, our scientists are very discontented because they, they notice now that they are very much isolated from each other. And what formerly was a very sensitive and, and uh, profound ability to get, to get get to each other on a demand basis is now almost 100% prohibited. There are chances they'll see an associate on their way into their office is very minor, and the chances that they can construct the kind of subtle moment of interchange in this situation is also very unlikely. Now they're discussing, uh, can we have a happy hour at 10 o'clock? Everybody will burst out of their lab and uh, suddenly become a babel of ideas and uh, important interchange, but nobody really thinks this is the solution to this thing. So to get back to this information problem now, the problem for the human performer now profoundly is going to be to search for relevant and current information, which somehow must stay within the bounds of reasonable human effort and allocation of, of time for information processing. An interesting commentary can be expressed by knowing the difference in the care and feeding between the man in the office or the living space <laughs> and the computer in the office. I'm, I'm, all, I'm sure you're aware if uh, Ball State College has a computer, somebody's in there every day or every two weeks uh, projecting new and better ways to use this piece of equipment. It's a fabulous individual if you treated it, treated it as, a, as some kind of a thing, some kind of a man or capability because it has such loving care and attention. What is really most inappropriate, though, is next door, the human performer uh, pretty much wrestles unattended with undisciplined, distorted, and imbalanced communication impact. He gets his communication, however, it just happens to occur. Um, at present, nobody is really responsible for developing his potential to improve performance as a communication user. user. Moreover, uh, he's faced with some very interesting monumental forces that are very much biased. Now, uh, you have to consider that uh, IBM Corporation, for instance, sees itself as a primary information solution, has all the appropriate devices. It makes its case uh, very rigorously. The telephone people make their case continuously as a as the best kind of communication device. Uh, Xerox company would like to see us all papered from end to end with copies of everything in sight. Uh, now this, all of these things are important and they all have potential to contribute, but it was really lacking and dangerously lacking is some idea that all of this communication impact needs to be proportionally impacted on the human performer. But uh, there is some hope in this because we are beginning to know how to serve the human performer. Now, uh, starting with the most expensive communication of idea of all, uh, the putting of people together, gathering like this, is, is a very <coughs> significant cost. 
And it's a purpose of most cities, the purpose of most uh, multi-storied buildings. It's really the reason why we accumulate people in large numbers and concentrations because it is eloquently clear that uh, this is the best way to achieve fundamental and subtle interchange. Now, the way we structure this, of course, is extremely important. First of all, uh, uh, talking over the telephone is one kind of investment. Going to see somebody is another kind. Writing a letter is another kind. All of these things, now we have continuous choices as far as the way we proportion our life. And uh, it, it's a really quite amazing the way people rise or fall now, depending on the kind of choices they make. Um, now, starting with just the relationship of people together as far as access to each other. Uh, it's very easy to determine now that people rise or decline in proportion to their access to relevant or important people. And it's really quite bizarre. For instance, quite bizarre the number of executive secretaries in major corporations who then now become chief officers, mainly because they are an important information valve between the president of a corporation and the subordinates. Or there are many instances where people ended up at the end of a corridor where their incidence of involvement with significant people was seriously declined, and these people suffer at the, uh, for this reason of decline in organizations. On the other hand, we've uncovered uh, extremely interesting accidental situations uh, at the University of Michigan. A uh, very interesting uh, psychologist who's in, whose work is in ways of learning, happened to have an office right off an elevator door, and uh, he was tremendously bothered by this because everybody that came out of the elevator immediately walked into his office and asked him what time of day it was and where classroom X was, and so he was a sort of a continuous information service to all kinds of cats and dogs visitors all day. So he had a, he had a sense of being overburdened by this incidental involvement of everybody. However, it happened that the mathematics department, people also popped out of the same elevator on the way to their department around the corner. And again, by asking where the drinking fountain is or who knows all of the incidental happenings, the psychology department gained an acquaintanceship with the mathematics department. Now both departments have evolved major new systems or new breakthroughs the psychology department because they now can use mathematical techniques in some of their processes. And the mathematics people, mathematics people have gained a new philosophic position in their theoretical math. Both of them freely admit that this is very important, uh, but it's also quite curious that they're both very confused about how this came about, except that they do know that their incidence of exposure to each other was high. Um, to cite a hideous example, though, um, I know of a, happen to know personally of a very, uh, a company that's made very spectacular growth in the last 20 years, or 10 years actually, most growth. And this was all accomplished during a period when they were quite an informal company, and again in almost the kind of surroundings that Parkinson described, in an older building. Their top management group were involved in a thing where they all had a chance to see each other accidentally and incidentally several times a day. Uh, they made much money, and then they decided to build a brand new building. This time, uh, because they determined that they had a traffic problem in the building, uh, they somehow got themselves involved in a double corridor system. This meant that to get out of your office, you had to go through one corridor, but then to go anywhere, you had to also go through a second corridor. In this case, the incidence of people of, of vital importance to each other having natural access to each other is almost zero. What's more, the, the top management people, in a perfect example of reductive expression, put themselves off in the corner behind a gold doorknob and a glass door yeah, which was very forbidding uh, status thing to enter. And it's very interesting the consequences of the management behavior of this company because of this actually built-in problem. 
uh, we were beginning to know many specific things. Uh, Canadian psychologist Robert Summer has determined that conversations between people sitting at the corners of the table occur twice as frequently as when people sit side by side, and six times as often as those between people across the table from each other. Now maybe this, when you think about this a little bit, you wouldn't really be surprised about this. And uh, many anthropologists now are beginning to discover that man has a very particular way he likes to position himself with each other. For staying with each other, we like to position ourselves somewhat at right angles. Uh, they've discovered that uh, this is by far the most productive interchange between, between people. If you sit side by side, like you would on a three-passenger sofa, you quickly tire of the, just the physical difficulty of trying to talk to somebody over the top of your shoulder. If you're too far away, you begin to uh, find this difficult. And then this is some of the things that are really quite idiotic about many handsome interiors where people try to work. I visited a director of research at DuPont, and we discussed this over lunch, and then I went up to his office, which uh, unfortunately for, was a perfect expression of a Mussolini-sized desk, <laughs> and, or, which uh, it would be almost impossible to have a fruitful conversation. Now, a research director, presumably, of all people, needs excellence in communication interchange, and in this case, <coughs> he would have the most difficulty. He was so embarrassed by this desk that he refused to go around behind the desk and sit down. He spent the rest of the day sitting on the front edge of his desk because it was very apparent that he had a difficulty with this kind of equipment. There are also very interesting views now on the scale, shape, and sizes of such things as tables. Rectangular tables express territorial definition. Round tables declare no boundaries. Uh, maybe some of you are aware of I see one of the major conferences at Potsdam or somewhere where the Russians insisted on using square tables and the, and the United States wanted to use a round table. And they finally resolved this by a table with corners chopped off. But uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this was a serious expression of what you would be trying to, to try to express in terms of territorial definition. Uh, perhaps you're aware of some of Edward Hall, the anthropologist Edward Hall's excellent writings on the silent language of space, again, telling very eloquently how we are dominated and controlled by space. So the rules of human behavior now in space are beginning to be rather well known to psychologists and largely ignored by space planners and furniture specifiers, although I hope this won't be for long. Uh, to get a little closer to man, uh, man's capability, what can he do best and what is it that he has limitations with? Um, Harvard psychologist Dr. George Miller has discovered something very intriguing about the human mind and a very precise limitation in information processing. He calls this magic seven plus or minus two as an explanation of the memory process. And uh, this peculiar phenomenon says that as long, uh, let's say you have 10 marbles on the table, as long as there are 10 marbles there, you, know, you would have a little difficulty in in determining how many there are there, but the minute you divide this off in a group of three and five or, or, and two, then you begin to say three, five, and two. You quickly determine this and control it. What, it, what he says is the mind can grapple with five or seven things, plus or minus two. Some people can handle nine things at a time, some people can only handle five. But if you try to manage information in more units than that, then you'll quickly boggle. This is the kind of phenomenon we see all the time with too many papers on your desk or too many things happening at the same time. And on the other hand, uh, peculiarly when you see people who are able to manage this discipline by unifying information into small packages and then identifying it, are able to command gigantic information assemblies. It's part of the thing reflected in our action office is the attempt to, with folder systems, to make small unit packaging that can be strongly identified and, this, and trying to reinforce just this kind of capacity. So a man is super capable as an information manager if you stay within some 
behavioral rules here about how he approaches it. Other interesting uh, kind of studies are being conducted on the incredible recall in ability of the eye in visual recall. Um, and I think you all would also understand this. Yeah, I could quickly look around the room here and condemn with millions of units of information actually and quickly pick out people that I would know. You have to under cogitate a little bit about well, the implications of this versus trying to draw back information just from memory. I put it away and now I'm going to try to remember where it was and how to bring it back. On the other hand, if I could see, see it in large quantities, it could, uh, it could be very acutely recovered if we knew how to display. One of the, I think, rather very peculiar things about our present environment and the kinds of things we express is this tr tremendously under-displayed nature of what we have around us. Now, architecture departments are, of course, a kind of an exception because they thrive on having things up, but uh, consider most of the rest of our surroundings. Essentially, we're very much deprived of things that mean very specific things to us, uh, even things that describe ourselves. And uh, uh, one of the, it's even a very serious communication limitation in that when you go into somebody's uh, home or office, if it's so manneristic and so devoid of personalized information, then you have a great deal of difficulty, a long time problem in trying to discover what this person is really about. On the other hand, the kind of office that has abundant display uh, very quickly tells people what you are. I, I'd like to discuss just briefly educational facilities are especially important as one of the new kinds of demands, what kind of form they should take, and what is, what is the best way to teach and who needs to learn. And another, in a way, they're sort of the hotbed of many of the things that I've been discussing about here. And the knowledge industry in itself is the biggest business in the U.S. today. And it really is a war of devices, concepts now underway in the educational areas. And it really is so dynamic that people are trying to consider what to use in educational facilities and what to, what to uh, commit to or are beginning to put up some rather interesting uh, guidelines. One that we've been very interested in is the comment that anything put in an educational facility will be changed within four years. And uh, the reason they say this is there's such dynamic process, progress in the way of, to teach and the concepts of education and movement toward better information services that everybody is very nervous about committing to highly fixed facilities. Uh, I think it's a very interesting uh, comment I heard recently that if, uh, if we continue to store book information on the present, in the present manner, Harvard University in 20 years would be one total library. We'd occupy easily the, all the buildings on the Harvard campus just to house a library. So it's pretty obvious that there has to be some new ideas in information storage and retrieval. One of the most interesting that I've heard is that uh, rather than trying to store, store everything, we store only the knowledge of how to regenerate information, in other words, the key to it. In this case, we keep the process and don't try to manage billions and billions of, <coughs> of units of information that we're all pretty much in difficulty in retrieving. Another very interesting thing to think about in this educational question of environment is who goes to school? Well, the answer is we all are going to go to school from now on. And an example of this is an engineer who graduated from school in 1900 would have 40 years after he graduated from school before there's any danger of his knowledge, school knowledge, becoming obsolete. Nowadays, a graduate engineer has less than five years of, before his knowledge will begin to be obsolete, and he has to consider now a process of continuous education. We really are none of us free from this responsibility now, so. Um, there's going to have to be serious consideration of how to surround ourselves with educational potential, not only in schools, but many kinds of remote delivery of information. 
to all kinds of offices. Uh, community facilities are going to have to serve whole communities as far as in this kind of service. And uh, it's undoubtedly going to cause, I think, a serious rise in the computer because it can deal with an individual on a unit basis and treat him on a random basis, too. Another, uh, one other thing I'd like to add to this now is the new dimensions of man's activity. Again, uh, it seemed to me that uh, in our visualization of the kind of surroundings, we've kind of grown up with the doctor, lawyer, merchant chief definition of the kind of spaces we occupy. Really, uh, 100 years ago, less than 50 definite definitions of professions. Uh, last year, I saw a piece of information by the Department of Commerce said that they've defined 32,000 separate professions. Now this, this is, what really is important here is that there really are a tremendous number of very different kinds of activities that man conducts now. And we're well beyond the point where this kind of uh, super, or super simple generalization will serve his needs. We need to be much more specific and eloquent in de designing things for this kind of broad diversity of performance. I think it's at least quite interesting to speculate on what this means to design. And I'd like to pose at least uh, several things that I think uh, may be quite important to you as designers or in thinking about your problems coming up. The first thing is that uh, we somehow begin to arrive at forms that embrace rather than resist change. Uh, sort of a quality of grace with change, as it is now, anybody that contends with institutional change or the need to revise our forms has a very difficult time. And this ability to meet change has to be at the same rate as the user is impacted by this change. And the user himself will have to begin to have facilities that he can re-express himself. Now this is a factor of both cost, appearance, and performance. Uh, I can give you another symptom of the problem that's coming up here. Uh, every phone, business phone in the country is changed every, at a rate of 1.2 per year. In other words, uh, is an incredible amount of shuffling of the location of phones in business. This means that people are forever changing their formation of, and to the point where they want the phone in a different place. And this is just a, a very minor symptom, but a very interesting one. Uh, also interesting is that this change rate now costs the, tele, the Bell telephone system alone $235 million in loss each year just to accomplish this change. Even though they charge you some to change, they also incur a tremendous loss. Now this also doesn't tell us <clears throat> the amount of penalty or inhibition we suffer from not being able to change reasonably when organizations need it or require it. I think we're also faced the same sort of thing in hospitals where uh, one of the perpetual problems now is having a hospital functionally obsolete before it's even occupied and many uh, consultants and professionals claim that within five years it would cost a sum equal to the original sum to merely bring it up to the present state of the art in patient care and hospital operations. So the tremendously acute difficulty and requirement now, uh, evidence and requirement now to consider a new form, new forms that will <coughs> endorse the idea that change is something that needs to be continuously re-expressed at the same rate that we're being impacted by. The second thing, I think we can expect that new forms that serve the new sophistication and complexity of human activity will begin to have to appear. And this means we'll be leaving many time-honored positions behind, I think. Now, Primarily, the sort of thing I've been describing is reductive in nature, and much of our buildings are. They have primary ability to be imposing, uh, to dominate, to produce awe, they have monumental forms. But I think there is much interest now in many organizations instead in living-oriented facilities that are first conceived with what has to be accomplished functionally, sort of buildings that begin inside with a man determining what he 
needs and what he proposed to do, the philosophy of the organization, and that the buildings and design now begin to express from this direction, we will begin to need the sort of pre-specification of the, of the operational behavioralists, the economists, the system engineers, and the environmental health specialists, all of who have really had no dialogue with the architectural profession to, to any extent. Uh, this needs to be a serious interchange and ability to develop understandable single goals with each other. Uh, lastly, I think there's also quite an important uh, effort now to be attentive to a new sense of appropriate use of world resources. And again, this is a question in a world that's rapidly closing in on its resources, of some kinds at least, that uh, we still need eloquence, of course, but we need to do it with appropriate economy. And we, of course, we, we are still all profoundly interested still in beauty of expression, but it needs also the kind of simplicity. I'd like to finish with a brief thing on uh, this somewhat frightening and maybe humorous, but also thought-provoking, I thought, the reports and experiment. Uh, uh, a recent extension of the stimulus enrichment approach to the study of imprinting in newly hatched chicks, that is, the development of the following response to the mother, is particularly instructive in revealing the psychologist's conception of the optimum set of stimulus conditions. The author describes the treatment to which the experimental animals were subjected immediately after hatching as follows. A complex environment <clears throat> consisting of a black walled enclosure with random stripes and blotches of white paint. Above was a bank of six 200 watt light bulbs which flashed on and off at one second intervals. Two metronomes produced a constant ticking. A radio tuned to a local AM station played constantly at high volume. Every 30 seconds, each chick was stroked with a foam rubber brush and with a whisk broom for 15 seconds. A bicycle bell rang for two minutes, er, er, rang every two minutes, and uh, gave a gentle puff of air from an air compressor. Now, uh, what can you imagine would be the consequence of that environment? <laughs> but let it be recorded that this treatment apparently worked wonders on the imprinting response of these chicks, which developed both earlier and stronger than for chicks who started life amidst more humdrum environmental conditions. Thank you. That stool, <clears throat> it's really a perch in our, to our mind and an elbow place, but it's also developed around some uh, health study information uh, that we've run on to that, um, first, first of all, we're interested in people not being too sedentary in offices because they're very good information showing that this is, shows serious decline for people in offices. But you can also show that standing all the time has bad effect too. But interestingly enough, one of the most restful and the least, and the position that involves the least muscular activity is the thing where you just barely hang there, just sort of perch your body uh, on the edge of something. And in other words, you don't commit yourself to a total seating operation and you don't have to stand, but if you can perch, just locate, take part of your weight off your feet, uh, this is shown by, uh, especially by some tests done by Japanese scientist Kohara, that this is one of the positions that requires the least energy and one of the most restful. Um, one of the difficulties you've had with this, most people visualize it as a stool and try to sit on it, but uh, you notice it's a long thing and, you, and you, you sit on the side of it and park your elbow. This is at least what we propose to be uh, the, pump, the purpose of it. The elbow aspect of it is uh, 
We've just taken data on uh, the lost limbs. Uh, if you look around most uh, situations, if I look around here now, I can see almost everybody is searching for a place for the arm and a place to support your head, even in difficulty. And then where you're supporting your head in, in places where you do have an ability. To, uh, for instance, uh, if you have a table in front of you and a chair you can sit back on, at least 60 or 80 percent of the people all will choose the table because they're more interested in arm support and head support than they are back. It's more of a difficulty, really, the place to put this appendage that frequently doesn't have a place to go. Yes, I, I think, though, that there, the people at all levels are inevitably becoming more informed about the consequences of what we know in science areas. So uh, I think it really is happening because well-informed people who run organizations of different kinds are beginning to try to, to move in this direction. And it is uh, undoubtedly going to have to be a serious team effort I don't think it's, it's uh, I hope it isn't frightening sounding. It is really most engaging. Uh, and I think architects especially would appreciate this kind of pre-structuring of the real nature of the kind of thing they're trying to design for. Real information about the kind of organization and the kind of uh, purpose of the thing you're trying to design for. I, th I think the architect will be most benefited by the evolution of this team concept. Any, any other questions? If not, we appreciate you coming here. It's my pleasure.